Nancy will introduce our speakers and will provide some preparatory comments as well. Thank you, Charles. Do you want to take your... Yeah, I'm going to take this. So, let me get this on. Sorry for the heat. This is a very uncomfortable place. Welcome to Third World Berkeley. Uh, uh, this is how it's going to be. This is what it's going to look like. Tough. So we're not going to um, spend a lot of time introducing the panelists. Uh, we have T.J. Clark, Distinguished Professor, George C. and Helen N. Party Chair of Modern Art, George Lakoff, Public Intellectual, Professor of Cognitive <coughs> Linguistics, uh, Charlie Shorts, Professor Emeritus, and our numbers <coughs> cruncher who knows more about the budget or can give us an alternative view of the budget than just about anyone. They're all famous. They're all very senior people. There's Professor the Bookends, Professor Laura Nader, Professor of Anthropology, will serve as the discussant, myself, Nancy Shepard Hughes, introducing and contextualizing the current context. Between us, I counted, we have more than 150 years experience at UC, <laughs> at UC Berkeley, so we can trust anything we have to say. We're not always going to agree, but we do have a very deep sense. So, um, as Charles said, that this is an extraordinary event and replacing what would normally be uh, a purely academic departmental faculty colloquium. And why? Because we're worried sick about uh, public and higher education in California. And we want to reach out to the public and to make clear what's at stake and what it is we want. And I hope that all of our uh, panelists will be talking about what it is we want to happen. Um, what we want from our colleagues, from our students, from our UC administrators, including our very absent chancellor and vice chancellors and vice 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 chancellors, of which there have been an enormous multiplication of numbers over the past 10 years, what we want of Pre President Udoff, mainly to step down, at least that's my view, what we want of UC regents, who we want to be educators and not businessmen, and what we're demanding of ourselves as professors and as faculty to preserve this grand institution, uh, according to many uh, serious surveys internationally, the best public institution counting all of the campuses in the world. Used and to be. That is now taking a bad hit. It's taken other hits in the past. So one thing, this is not about pay cuts. It's not about us whining about we're being paid 10% less or 5% less or whatever. Uh, it is a bit about public secrets and public lies. We are not taking furloughs, we are taking pay cuts. These pay cuts may be permanent. This is uh, not about the UC-wide uh, call for one day strike on September 24th, though many of us will participate, participate in many in different ways. Most faculty will be involved in more teaching rather than less teaching during this furlough. We'll be engaged in teachings and speaking publicly, speaking on uh, public radio and going to libraries and reaching even our town council members here in Berkeley. The crisis in public education is like the snow in Dublin, as James Joyce put it. Put it. It's general at this moment. It's not just us. It is other, and it's even attacking private universities as well. We're an anxious post-9-11 nation mired in a great recession. We're residents of a renegade state, a principality, I don't know what it is, comprised of citizens who wage tax rebellions and who have refu refused to support our public institutions. So our, over the years, this is not a new problem. The university has been steadily defunded. But I want to tell you about a couple of other occasions in the history of the University of California when we have had similar crises. We have survived those and we have thrived. And, uh, uh, and what I want to address is that our present administrative response to the state of affairs has been utterly appalling and unlike the responses in previous crises. It is mostly a power grab via grabbing emergency powers to do as it wishes without consultation with the faculty senate, let alone with the general faculty. So what we're facing not only an economic crisis, but a political crisis. But because it's a political crisis, it can be undone. This is the state of California, the state of the gold rush. It's weathered a great many financial booms and busts. We survived the university, the Great Depression. We survived the Great Recession in the early 90s. And uh, you know we have some other 
grueling problems right now with the failing war in Afghanistan, the crisis in, yet again, crisis in American uh, medical health care reform, and we have on top of that the dismantling of America's workforce following the outsourcing of industrial jobs, jobs that we know will never come back. So we can understand why we're facing a paralyzed, frightened, economically battered citizenry. And, uh, you know, but nonetheless, the faculty here are fighting to keep our promise to the people of California, even though the people of California have not kept their promise to us. Nothing happens without struggle, without a willingness to court controversy, to take risks, and to sustain possible retaliation. Um, all of the historical battles of this university were battled, were battlegrounds. The battle for shared governance that we hold so precious took a faculty revolution in 1919 and 1920 to force the legislature and the UC regents to recognize the academic senate and its role in governing this university. The independence of the senate was officially recognized including its right to choose its own committees and to oversee all tenure and promotion cases. And this was through our budget committee charged with um, stamping out, with, with maintaining excellence and stamping out any private sweet deals between administrators and individuals that are standard in many, if not most, private institutions. So that's part of this public le legacy is that we control promotion and tenure. The same was true of the faculty battles against the loyalty oath during the McCarthy era in the 1950s, the struggles for free speech in the 60s, the struggles against military recruitment on campus, against nuclear weapons research, the anti-apartheid divestment strikes, the struggle for affirmative action, and the struggle even for university-supported daycare. These things came through faculty and graduate student and staff direct action, through sit-ins, through walkouts, the occupation of buildings, Yes, even the occupation of California Hall, I know because I was party to some of these, especially the founding of UC Daycare. Um, but there's some differences today, and that's what I, it's this feeling that one gets of the terror and the fear that our public are feeling, some of our students and our younger faculty are seeing and responding to. In the days of all of these faculty walkouts, untenured faculty were not protected. They were asked to join in. Graduate students were asked to join in. Now we're saying, no, it's too great a risk, but then the habit of courage is lost because by the time one has tenure, if one is always correcting oneself, then one really can't learn to exercise the freedom of speech. So one has to trust one's colleagues. One has to trust the kind of solidarity of the university. Well, there's been a wonderful article circulating by Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, I hope all of you read it, in which she makes very clear the notion that, you know, what kind of a university do, do we want? I would suggest that there are two big models, you know, the Cardinal Newman model of the university as a kind of a sanctuary and a refuge for scholars and monks, for people who will distribute universal truths. And then there is the modern notion of the university as a critical institution actively engaged in social and political transformations of the society of which is a part. Now that problem of public engagement is always there. And sometimes the administration has used it against us. So for example, after World War II, the university, especially the public university, was seen by the federal government, as well as by the legislators uh, of, of California, as a tool for uh, really to serve the engine of economic growth, but also uh, protection of our, of our own state, of our government, that uh, shades of President Eisenhower's military industrial complex. So in those post-war years, U.S. State Department uh, considered UC as both a weapon and as an engine for fueling economic and political prowess through technological dominance, fashioning better, fashioning better planes and warheads, developing what seems to be benign area studies, Latin American, European, Middle East, Asia, Africa, but really to protect American dominance uh, you know, in the world by understanding the world. Okay, so it's not all leftist can't about being involved uh, and being useful. And we have all these threats today. I, I won't go into them about privatizing the university, about cutting back by the thousands the number of 
undergraduate students that will be able to study here next year, about drafting wealthy students that can pay full price from other states to compensate for that, um, the uh, closure of programs, the consolidation of organized research units. We fear that there are vulnerable departments. Anthropology may actually, my friends, be one of them, where noise in the system, cultural anthropology, as is sociology, we are not beloved by administrations because we are critical thinkers and free thinkers.